كان والدي دائما الابتسام وكان يعمل راعيا للماشية لقد علمني أن الغذاء هو سبيل السعادة porque los caminos que recorremos entrelazan, dando vida a una infinita variedad de historias. Les poissons que je pêche chaque jour, on ne les trouve que dans ces eaux. Nous nous prions de l'énergie, de l'énergie. Et nous, nous devons nous nourrir le monde. It's time to take action. We all have a role to play. Давайте добьемся лучшего в жизни и в обществе повсюду. We need a food system that sustains lives, the planet and protects its workers. لأن مصيرنا واحد، أفعالنا هي مستقبلنا. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us. From around the planet, I want to welcome you to World Food Day. It's a day that every year we celebrate as the birthday of the Food and Agriculture Organization. Now, 75 years ago, we gather to remember that, and we also gather so that we can rededicate ourselves to ending hunger, to tackling hunger. And this year, we're also counting down. We're in the 10-year countdown. To our 2030 global goal of zero hunger, it takes a whole village. It takes a whole global village to pull off a program like this. I want to thank first our presenting partners, our program partners in this, the World Affairs Council of America, and the World Food Programs USA office in Washington, who are our program partners for this program. Also, those who have been able to support us financially to make this possible free of charge. There's over 800 people around the world uh, registered already and going to the program. And in that uh, opportunity, we've been supported by the McKnight Foundation, King Solutions, Hormel Foods, the Regenerative Agriculture Foundation, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and Greater MSP. But I want to make a very special, very special thank you to our members. Those of you who support us year after year with your membership make these possible. We are cor have corporate members, Ecolabs and Land of Lakes and Sid Investment and Delta and Cargill and Medtronic and United Health Group, some of our uh, very, very generous and very, very faithful corporate sponsors. But also we have individuals from all over the planet who support the work that we do. If you're not a member and you'd like to join us and be part of this on your screen, on the YouTube screen, there's a description place for that. But in that uh, uh, opportunity, we want to let you know how grateful we are that you've taken time to be with us here today. In this year, a complicated year, we thought we would do World Food Day in Minnesota, you know, in a conference center or something like that. No, we're in a new world. And that world has been greatly assisted inside of Global Minnesota by the incredible board of directors we have. The president of our board last year, who was in the middle of his term, uh, Ross Wilson was, Ambassador Ross Wilson was asked to go to Afghanistan to serve as the, the in, in reference, the ambassador to Afghanistan. And very fortunately, our vice president, Muffy McMillan, st stepped up, took the reins of this organization and helped us move through these very, very complicated times. He's had a lot of experience as a global humanitarian, philanthropist, sits on the board of global organizations that really are good partners of ours. So she brought a kind of experience and network that's made a big difference in our success this year. And I would like to ask our board president, Muffy McMillan, to now unmute her uh, video and to join me and to welcome and introduce our keynote speaker, Honorable David Beasley. Thank you, Muffy, and please unmute yourself and join me. Thank you, Mark. On behalf of the Global Minnesota Board of Director Directors, welcome to World Food Day 2020. I'm Muffy McMillan, and as Mark noted, I'm the current board chair. 
When asked, I was happy to serve as chair because of the needed role Global Minnesota plays in engaging Minnesota with the world. Today's conference is a perfect example of convening critical dialogues on global issues, something the organization has been doing for nearly 70 years. This morning, I have the honor of introducing our opening speaker, the Honorable David Beasley, Executive Director of the World Food Program, former Governor of South Carolina, Profile in Courage Award winner, scholar, and an amazing humanitarian. On behalf of Global Minnesota, we welcome you to World Food Day 2020. Congratulations to you and all of your World Food Program team for the great honor of being named the 2020 Nobel Peace Prize Laureate. The Nobel Committee could not have chosen a more deserving organization to this, for this distinguished award. The World Food Program was born out of a passionate concern of President Eisenhower that the United Nations ensure that emerging situations such as hurricanes, civil wars, massive fires, and other natural and man-made disasters would be properly dealt with. This was done by bringing the most advanced science and technology to bear on growing, protecting and preparing our daily bread. Since first promoted by President Eisenhower back in 1960, it has grown to be the largest humanitarian organization on the planet. The scope of their work is incredible. This year, they are feeding 133 million people across 80 countries during this COVID pandemic crisis. I sit on the board of the Cargill Foundation, where we provide support to nonprofit organizations in our headquarters community of the Twin Cities to nourish and educate the next generation. I was very pleased and proud to see that Cargill understands how the current difficulties with food insecurity are affecting people around the world. I'm proud of our stepping forward to honor and celebrate the World Food Program team by matching the Nobel Peace Prize with another $1 million. This contribution builds on our 20 year partnership to address food insecurity and advance farmer livelihoods around the world. David is a wonderful individual and I'm honored to have him as a friend. A friend who found out a few days ago that his organization has won the Nobel Peace Prize. Please join me in welcoming David Beasley, Executive Director of the United Nations World Food Program to Global Minnesota's World Food Day 2020 conference. Thank you, David. Muffy, always great to see you. I just wish I were there, I could get a hug. But even if we were together, we can't hug nowadays, all this COVID stuff, you know. But it's <laughs> great, great to see you. And thank you for your you know, moral, spiritual support, but thank you also for the financial support, particularly at a time such as this when we've got more uh, suffering, struggling around the world than any time period in a long, long, long time. And so it's great to be with all of you. I wish I were in Minnesota, but with the virtual reality that we live in today, we got to do what we got to do. And, and uh, I'm in Rome today. And so it's late in the afternoon here and I'm about to do a news conference in New York in just a few minutes. I just gave another speech uh, in another place around the world a few minutes ago. And so we'll talk about a connected world. But you would think with all the technology and all the wealth around the world today, with all this connectedness, we wouldn't have anybody going to bed hungry anyway, anywhere. I mean, really, with $370 trillion worth of wealth on earth today, to think that 690 million people go to bed chronically hungry. And on top of that, 270 million people literally on the brink of starvation. Uh, that's not good. So an, an indictment on humanity that any child goes to bed hungry, much less dies from starvation. So when we received the award, you can imagine I was, it was Friday. I was in, uh, I was in uh, Niger and I can't think of actually a more appropriate place in the world to be because of what's unfolding uh, in Niger, in the Sahel region. And so I was in a meeting 
and talking to a government official and somebody just comes busting in the in the room and i was like what in the world and it says nobel peace prize and i'm like well, oh who won it who won it and it said we did and, and i was really like wow you've got to be kidding me and it's an absolute honor and a tribute to the women and men who put their lives on the line at risk every single day at the World Food Program in war zones, areas of conflict, destabilization, whether it's hurricanes, cyclones, it doesn't matter. Our people are out there. When most people are running and hiding, we're out there putting ourselves in harm's way because we are, in fact, helping, keeping, helping keep people alive all over the world. And so I would like to have received this award because we've ended hunger. Quite frankly, when you look at the numbers, when I arrived three and a half years ago to head up this organization with these extraordinary men and women, our partners like Cargill and many of you, we were at 80 million people on the brink of starvation. And right before COVID, the numbers had spiked to 135 million people driven primarily by man-made conflict. Compound that with climate extremes, droughts, floods, you name it, along with fragile governance and you see why it's gone from 80 to 135 million now because of covid it's rippling around the world economically supply chain disruption we're now talking about the number of people not going to bed hungry now but the people on the brink of starvation to 270 million people now if i looked at the fact that i was I took this role three and a half years ago, and we've gone from 80 million to now 270 million. I think you need to fire somebody, in fact, uh, because what's going wrong? My goal when I, and Muffy and I have talked about this, and so has uh, Mark and I, when I arrived at the World Food Program, my objective was to put the World Food Program out of business because we would no longer be needed. We would create resilience and sustainability in nations all over the earth. Because when I arrived, I was looking at some of the countries where the United Nations and operations, including USAID and other, were, had been in a country 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And I'm like, well, why are we still there? If we were doing our job, if we had achieved goals and objectives, shouldn't we be out of there and people are, their systems are sustainable. But the world's very fragile, falling apart in a lot of different ways. In spite of all this advanced technology, which, which we use in so many different ways, man-made conflict is driving up the hunger rates in unprecedented ways. And that with uh, climate change is really, really a problem. And so we are in over 80 something countries. We assist last year about 100 million people. This year we're trying to scale up, uh, depending upon funding, about 100 and 38, give or take, million people. It depends on the situation and what type of funds we get. But let me kind of paint a, a good picture and a, and a very bad picture. 200 years ago, when the world was population uh, 1.1 billion, you had about 90, give or take, 90, 94% of the people were in extreme poverty. Today, less than 10%. So, of a world population of about 7.6, give or take, billion people. And so what we've been able to do is build systems over the past 200 years that's sharing more wealth and assisting more people than any time period in world history. That's remarkable success. Now, try telling that to the 800, 900 million, billion people that are still struggling. But that doesn't mean we tear down the system that's allowing us to help the 90-something percent. What it does mean, though, we've got more work to do. And boy, do we. Because when COVID came on the scene, I'd already been telling, actually, right before COVID, at the end of last year, leaders around the world that 2020 was going to be the worst humanitarian crisis year since the creation of the United Nations and World War II. And when I began breaking it down, going by country by country, region by region, leaders would be like, oh my gosh. I remember, I remember right, it was, uh, COVID was just sort of hitting the scene. Uh, and it was about the end of March and Tony Blair had called me and Tony said, he said, David, you, you're all over the world. He says, what are you seeing out there? I said, well, Tony, I said, what really is concerning us is that uh, many of the leaders at the time are making decisions on COVID 
a health pandemic in a vacuum, not understanding if you don't balance this right, you're going to disrupt supply chains and completely obliterate, diminish the economic opportunity, and you'll have economic uh, contraction in nations around the world. And I said, I broke it down into about 10 countries over the next four quarters. And Tony was like, oh my God, you know, nobody's seen the big picture. And so I went and spoke to the the to the United Nations Security Council explaining that if we're not careful, the cure is going to be much worse than the disease. So we must handle this right. It's not COVID versus hunger. We must actually work together these issues to minimize the death and the struggling and suffering of people all over the world. And so when I went to the Security Council and spoke and said, we must do these things. Otherwise, we're going to have catastrophe. We're going to have famines upon of biblical proportions all over the world. And so leaders around the world responded. But let me explain a little bit why I'm very concerned about 2021 versus 2020 comparatively. Because the monies that we received for 2020 were based upon, as you can imagine, uh, the budgetary system of 2019, where the economies were, were relatively strong around the world, the United States, Germany, the UK, the EU, I can keep going. And so we had about $8.4 billion appropriated for 2019 and 2020, uh, about, about the same, give or take. Well, those monies were appropriated over a year ago. Well, now the needs have spiked. The governments have reached deeper into their pockets to help more people in this time that we're facing. The governments have put $17 trillion worth of economic stimulus out into the marketplace. They can't do that again. And the economies are de deteriorating and around the world. And when you look at remittances, let me just go through a few more points. Remittances are down over $100 billion. The informal economy, which is 2 billion employees, or 2, pe 2 billion people, they've been just dynamically devastated by COVID. They say that over 495 million jobs, so to speak, have been destroyed because of COVID. Now see, you in Minnesota or New York or LA, you've got in your pantry probably two, three, four weeks worth of food. You might not like what you're eating the third week, but you're gonna be okay. In the places where we are in the hundred and the 80 some odd countries, uh, these people live literally hand to mouth every day. They don't have a pantry full of food. And so the supply chain is critical. You remember how difficult it was in the first few weeks of COVID panic buying. You couldn't get toilet paper, for example. If you're having that uh, in the most sophisticated supply chain system in the world, you can imagine what's happening in Niger or Yemen or Syria or Chad or Mali. Uh, just imagine. And so what we've been seeing, declining currency, inflation, spike in food prices into these areas that were already fragile. And if you compound some of these areas, like where I was last week in the Sahel, where you've got ISIS and Al-Qaeda and Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab and other extremist groups exploiting the vulnerability and fragileness of this particular area, if we're not careful, we will be facing famine, destabilization, and mass migration. And I can tell you it's a thousand times more expensive after the fact, it'd be like having a few water lines in your ceiling and you've got uh, four water lines that are, have a little leak, but you've got, a, you've got a stain on the carpet and a rip in your screen door and you've only got a hundred dollars. You can only fix one. Are you gonna fix the leaking pipes or are you gonna go fix the screen door, a uh, little tear in the screen or the little stain in the carpet? I know what you're gonna do because if you don't fix the leaking pipes, you could then be replacing the ceiling all the carpet, the flooring, all the furniture, everything. It's like, as I say, with the Titanic heading to the iceberg, you either can focus on the iceberg or worry about the problems of furniture inside. This is a time when we have to be focused on the icebergs. It is critical.
because we are literally facing an extraordinary time period ahead of us. We've been doing the mathematical analysis. In fact, by the way, my economist is a graduate of the University of Minnesota, and uh, he was bragging about that just a little bit earlier. And so we're not going to have the availability of funds like we had in 2020. And the people that are struggling are being hit even harder. So when you look at countries like Ethiopia, 50% of their export revenues, tourism. Well, tourism's gone. Uh, Nigeria, South Sudan, 90, 95% of their export revenues, oil. Well, you know what happened to oil prices? Tanking. And I can start breaking down country by country by country. And so it's a, it's a very concerning time period. And so we've got to reach deep in our pockets. And that's why I'm so glad that Cargill, Muffy, thank you so much for being that voice. Uh, the world's at a very fragile time. I mean, I want to be talking to you in a lot more detail about how we're going to resolve long-term food security, because I'll, I'll tell you from my experience that you will not solve the hunger problem. And I'm not talking about the short-term phenomena, which is a phenomena, but short-term and long-term, you're not going to solve it through philanthropy. Philanthropy and charity is very important, but long-term sustainability has got to come through the private sector. Historically, in my opinion, uh, the private sector was sort of shunned from the United Nations, but I really see a renewed spirit in the United Nations and others beginning to realize that we've got to do this together, that the private sector is critical. So working with partners like Cargill and many of you, but I'm not asking you to help me be more efficient, even though that's a very important thing. And we work with a lot of you further so that at the World Food Program, we are more efficient. We are more strategic. But we will never pull ourselves out of these countries without your engagement, bringing your systems into play, improving agricultural inputs, outputs, sustainability. That's going to be the key. And that's what we want to continue to work on. I, I love talking about some of the things that we're doing now. You can go into the Niger area, Mali, where, you know, climate, you know, we might debate all day long what's causing the climate to change. But I can tell you, being out there where we are, you have no doubt about the climate's changing. Now, that's, I can tell you, a matter of fact, because we're seeing the droughts, the flooding. I mean, you can take an average rainfall in a country that really hadn't changed that much, but you're getting more flash floods in a particular season. You're getting more droughts in another season. And it might balance out to be the average for the year, but it's dynamically impacted the, the local people. In places like Niger or Marley, Burkina Faso, when you see this parched land, and I'm not talking about just a little bit of land, I'm talking about thousands of miles in this Sahel, where the Sahara is moving down about a kilometer per year and pushing the herders down into the farmers and then the extremist groups exploit that division, et cetera, et cetera. But we come in and do uh, water harvesting projects, what we call half moons and many other uh, zite or other types of techniques that we use. And we have been rehabilitating with our beneficiaries because I believe that every beneficiary wants to be involved with a, with a community improvement project, a food for asset type project. I haven't met a beneficiary yet uh, that said, you know, I really love this outside support. We go sit around and do nothing. I haven't met one of those yet. They all want to be independent and free of outside support. And I've stood there on the hill with, with particularly women and oh, uh, the, these women beneficiaries are amazing. And uh, I had this woman say, Mr. Beasley, she said, I have this five acres of land, and because you've taught us this technique of rehabilitating the land, capturing water, we're no longer needing your support for our family, but we're now feeding our village. And if I can get five more acres of land, we could be selling into the marketplace and making money. And you can't imagine what that means. And when we go into an area like that and do a land rehabilitation project, and put on top of that, like a school meals project, it's amazing what happens in these areas. Recruitment by ISIS or Al-Qaeda drops off the chart. Migration 
drops off the chart. Marriage rates by 12, 13 year old little girls drops off the chart. The pregnancy rate drops off the chart. Now you can quantify economically all those dynamics. So what do you think is cheaper? To keep doing it like we always did it for about 20, 30 years, you'll be doing that forever and ever, or come in and do it strategic, more effective, and we no longer need to be there. And let me give you another example. This was in, uh, and this is a typical example. This was in uh, in Afghanistan and the Mar, Mar el Sharif, Sharif area. If you've watched some of the movies about Afghanistan wars, you'll know where I'm talking about, very difficult area. And so historically, we would just bring in food. Uh, you know, the United States farmers, which, you know, USAID in the U.S. And by the way, let, let me let me divert for just a minute. I know you're watching the presidential election and the politics around America. And there's so much division. It's heartbreaking. It really is. It seems like the Democrats and Republicans are fighting over everything. Doesn't matter what it is. Somebody says it's snowing. Somebody says no, it's sunny outside. Somebody says it's raining. No, it's you know what I'm talking about. But when it comes to international aid and food security. When I walk over into the Senate, into the House, into the White House, both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, it's like they drop everything they're doing, differences that they have, and come together when it comes on behalf of the American people, help, helping the poor people around the world. It is a remarkable thing, as I call it, the miracle on Pennsylvania Avenue today. It really is. So the american people i know when they know this tragedy when they know they're suffering when they know they're struggling they step up but unfortunately in the last couple of years you turn on the television it's all it was it was last year with brexit 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 trump 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 now it's covid 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 trump 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 you got the elections and so it's hard to break through to let the american people know about the wars in yemen the sahel and syria and iraq and the tragedies in lebanon and ethiopia and drc and somalia etc cetera, etc cetera. and so thank you to the american people thank you for your voice thank you for helping us be more strategic so back to afghanistan so instead of what we would do in the past just bring food in from the outside we went and met with the farmers on the eastern side of the country where you have peace and stability. And we said, we'll buy the food from you, but we need this quantity and this quality. We'll pay this price. So guess what happened? They hired more people, bought more equipment, you know, tractors and trucks. And the milling operations did the same thing. And so then we bought the same quantity from locally within, stimulating the local economy. And then we went to the other side of the country and met with the village leaders where you would have flash floods and droughts. Flash floods would come out of the mountains and just devastate the valley, or there'd be a drought. And so we said, we're gonna give you this food on the condition that you will help us. We'll help you rehabilitate the landscape. So there's small holding ponds and dams and reservoirs. When you have the flash floods, the water's contained. And then when you have the droughts, we've got the irrigation systems that you're going to dig and work with us on down into the cropland. And so I stood there at the top of the hill with this tribal leader, the elder, and I said, so what's happening now? He's just so much pride. He said, our children are no longer joining extremist groups, anti-government rebel forces, nor are they leaving. And they're staying here because they see there's a future. That's the World Food Program. And that's because of supporters like you that are out there giving us the support that we need as we will work to change systems around the world. And each area is different in what we do and how we do it. And that's why we're so flexible and so fluid. And I think the Nobel Peace Prize the committee recognized what we are doing, the importance of what we're doing, the partners that are engaged with us, but they also recognize the world's at a crossroads. And we've got a lot of work to do. The question we're trying to think through now is how do we take advantage of this Nobel Peace Prize to inspire and encourage people around the world to recognize the need of food security and the relationship between war and peace and food? because there's no doubt conflict drives up hunger and hunger drives up conflict. In the Syrian war, for example, if we could have gone in there and done what we needed to do right early on, it would have spared billions upon billions of dollars. But the international community waited too late and you had mass migration. 
you know, we could feed a Syrian, for example, in Syria for about, give or take, 50 cents. It's a war zone because it's a little more expensive. That same Syrian, if it ends up in Brussels or Berlin, for example, the total humanitarian support package is 50 to 100 euros per day. And I can tell you, when you feed 100 million people per day like we do, we survey people all the time. We know what they're thinking. We know what's going on in the neighborhood. And they tell us they don't want to leave. In fact, they'll move two to three to four times inside their country, going to their aunts or their grandfathers or cousins or friends before they'll finally leave their homeland. People don't like to leave their home. But, but if you have no peace and you don't have food, you're going to do whatever you need to do for your children to survive. And that's what we are facing in many of these regions around the world today. Unfortunately, 80% of our operations now and expenditures are in war zones and conflict areas. Imagine the billions of dollars that would be available for development if it weren't for man-made conflict. In fact, $16 trillion of GDP is impacted because of man-made conflict. Imagine what that would do to help stimulate economies around the world. So we've got a lot of work to do. The world's dependent on us. And I'd like to say one day we are out of business. I don't think it's gonna be anytime soon, but partnering with you, all of you, I, I need to ask you to help us every way you can right now because it is an all hands on deck. It's a call to action right now. You must understand how concerned we are about 2021. This is, this is a very delicate time period in world in world history. But I'm hopeful. I'm one of those that does not believe that the sun is setting or the glass is half empty. I believe it's half full. And I believe in the heart of the American people and people around the world. Uh, I really do. People ask me, says, how do you, how do you not get depressed? And I say, well, when you get out there and see those little girls, those little boys, I mean, whether it's in Yemen or in the middle of a war zone with nothing and you, you see life, and it, it inspires you, encourages you. Scott Pelley was on, on 60 Minutes. He and I were doing a show on Yemen. And, uh, and Scott was really moved uh, by, by the interview and all of my team. And at the end of the interview, we were taking our mic off. And, and Scott said, he said, Governor, he said, you've got the greatest job on earth. And, and I said, Scott, I do. I really do. I said, but I'm going to say something that you haven't thought of and it's gonna bother you. And he looked at me like, what in the world could that be? And I said, Scott, I don't go to bed at night thinking about the children we saved. I go to bed at night weeping over the children we could not reach. So when we don't have enough money nor the access, many times we have to choose which children eat, which children don't eat. I said, how would you like that job? And then Scott looked at me, just tears in his eyes, says, oh, my God, I never thought about that. And I said, well, we have to think about it every day. So with $360 trillion worth of wealth a day, there is no reason that a child would go to bed hungry. With all the technology and expertise that we have there out there today, a child shouldn't go to bed hungry. We've got our work cut out for us. We've made a lot of progress in the last 200 years, but the work's not done. And so, Muffy, it's great to be here. I could talk for, as you know, about this subject for a, another hour or not another day, but let me stop right there. Um, Mark and Muffy, let me turn it back over to you to, uh, thank you. to proceed on. And thank you for letting me be with you. I know it's early in the morning there and it's late in the afternoon here. and. And uh, to be with you anytime, any place, anywhere is always a blessing to me. And, and I just can't tell you how much I appreciate that. Thank you so much, David. I know uh, Muffy and I both so appreciate your taking time for this. And we have uh, a little bit of time left and a couple questions that uh, I think might ring bell. May I proceed, Muffy, you want to? Uh, Yes, I'd, I'd like to say thank you from everyone, David, for your insights, education, passion, 
and basically unrelentless energy around the World Food Program. You know, David, the world is so lucky to have you. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Well, I don't know how lucky they are. They, I, as I tell them, I'm not their leader. I'm their cheerleader. <laughs> well, well, thank you. So, so, David, one of the things that you mentioned about how next year will go, um, I know that in this afternoon's program, we're going to be hearing from your director of operation, Amher, about the partnership that got built over the last few years and then mobilized the common services. Can you share with the, all of us watching about that? I mean, that is human advancement. If you've got armor speaking to you, you go get your ear full because he is amazing <laughs> out there. I, it's I mean, at one o'clock central daylight oh time in Minnesota. You gotta put your seatbelt on because <laughs> when you start breaking down what we do, where we do it, I'm not talking about simple, simple places, complex areas where you just can't even get anything into and how we can drop food from the sky. And I, I can start talking about that all day long and be inspired by what our men and women do out there and how we work with private sector to re rethink the way we do things to be more strategic and more efficient, and more effective. But let me just give you on this, uh, at this point of supply chain with regards to COVID and cause not many people realize we're the actual logistics backbone for the United Nations. We don't deliver just food, but we also do the humanitarian supplies around the world. So COVID's on the scene and it's compounded uh, because of the commercial airline business pretty much shutting down, right? They weren't flying into all these areas. So how are you going to get COVID supplies, equipment, PPE, medicines, nurses, doctors, humanitarians? A huge problem. So we step up and we become the humanitarian logistical backbone for COVID. And so over 80,000 cubic meters of supplies into over, I think, 172 countries around the world. We've uh, delivered 24,000 passengers just in the past couple of few months uh, into the most difficult areas for getting doctors and nurses, humanitarians out into the field so they can do their job in these countries that are struggling in so many ways, especially with the COVID impact. And so you can only imagine. And so uh, you're getting supplies out there, whether it's UNHCR refugee material, UNICEF, WHO, uh, you name the agency, we are the logistics backbone for that. And our teams are remarkable. Most of the time it's by ships and trucks and planes, but sometimes we're dropping from 20,000 feet in the air or several thousand feet in the air. Uh, just to give you a real, real quick short story, this was in uh, Deir ez -Zor in Syria in the, this town, city of about 100,000 people, had been besieged by ISIS. And uh, they were able to hold the perimeter. They couldn't penetrate, but they, then they couldn't get any food in. So how do you, what, how do you deal with that? Because ISIS wouldn't allow us to go in. And so how do you drop food into a small city and hit a football field? You can't drop it from two, 3,000 feet. Why? Because ISIS had RPGs that could hit and other military equipment that could hit up to about 15,000 feet in the air. So we needed to redesign a system to drop food from 20,000 feet in the air that wouldn't be hit by missiles and then hit that football field. It'd be like they said, throwing a, a dart to a bullseye, I think 4,200 times and never missing the bullseye. And we kept those 100,000 people alive until finally the, seat, the city was freed. And that's the type of of uh, supply chain people we have. And uh, in Sudan, we redesigned a parachute when, because a lot of these places, you can't just, you can't land an airplane because it might be flooded for hundreds of miles. You can't put down. So you've got to drop a lot of food from the sky. And when you're feeding you know, millions of people from the sky, it's a very, very costly program. And so we're always trying to do things more inexpensively because if we save a dollar, that's four meals for children. And so when you're dropping food from the sky, it's, you, dropping cooking oil is a problem. You can imagine. So we would have to bring in it by a helicopter. Well, we redesigned the parachutes and the suppression system when the, so that when the cooking oil was to be dropped from several thousand feet, it wouldn't explode and et cetera. That saved us $24 million, give or take, a year. That's 100 million meals. 
for children. And that's how the people of the World Food Program think. That's how Amr thinks, because we know when we save a dollar, that's saving lives. And right now, we don't have enough food. We don't have enough money for all the people that we need to reach, because we're going to need billions of dollars more next year. And so we can be as efficient as we can, but we've got to have the American people step up like they've never stepped up before. So anyway, uh, Mark, you see, I get really fired up about this because what our people do is, is really amazing. Well, and I think that's the part about talking to Amr and talking to his partner, you know, Mike Ryan at World Health Organization. Oh, yeah. That over the years, building partnerships like around the Ebola crisis, you know, which, you know, Minnesotans were involved in, our National Guard trained thousands, some of our young men and women to go be the back office for that Ebola battle. And they didn't have to go because of the success of the public health sector. Of uh, the investment by the United States and the AIDS uh, public public policy work around AIDS and public health, but in that partnership, yes. it seems to me we see the future. You know, we talk about the Sustainable Development Goals, number seventeen partnerships. It looks to me like World Food Program, World Health Organizations have a real partnership that sets the bar high for a future when, as you mentioned more climate disruption, civil conflict. We're going to need that example that you have established uh, to be a really seen as a global value for all of us. Well, you know, working with uh, WHO, UNICEF, UNHCR, and there's a great camaraderie. And, and what I have found is, is we try to reform the UN system. You know, you can build the best system in the world. If you put lousy managers in, it won't matter. Or you can have the worst system and have the best managers and you make it work. We're trying to get where you got the best system and the best managers. And what I have found to be the most successful reform in the UN system since I've arrived is the leadership. We sit down and in one of the first few weeks when I was at the UN, I started attending some meetings and it was just talk, 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 talk. It drove me up the wall. And so we started having private meetings, uh, myself and a few of the key leaders in the areas that we have concern and it was the cooperation collaboration because i would be like look if you can do something better than we can uh that's great let's go do it or how can we support you and it was that sort of collaboration cooperation that really has improved operations and working with who out in the field and unicef and supply chain and all the different dynamics taking place in the most difficult circumstances like ebola i mean we were the we are the containment mechanism for ebola not many people would realize that but we do what we do good we know how to move people and move food and try to keep things contained so you don't spread you know diseases like ebola which has a fatality rate I think, oh my gosh, 30 something percent or something like that. Right. Well, I know that that infrastructure now, you're the largest humanitarian association, uh, organization. You're also the largest airline at the moment. But also, I know that in addition to moving food and medical and, you know, things that people need and being moving the people, you also operate the medevac system for the humanitarian workers who get sick with COVID or something else happen. That seems to me to be an extraordinary part of your mandate, but also, you know, many Minnesotans and people watching you today from all over the world are humanitarian, probably have been in the Peace Corps, in AID, in a program, Save the Children, you name it. You're being the medevac, that emergency responder, the 911 for the world, seems to me to be that we are advancing as a people and um, this is an important thing, uh, you know, as some of us think about, uh, you know, that possibility or that opportunity, knowing you're there to help people get to a hospital, you're even putting hospitals close to people. Yeah. Tell us a little bit just about that. Well, and, and Amr, we, we built a hospital, uh, I think, in four weeks in some difficult circumstances. We just did it in Ghana. We did it in uh, Ethiopia, uh, as well as a couple other places, because you can imagine with COVID uh, spiking around the world and people that are dedicating their lives, putting their lives at risk every day out, out in some of these very difficult places, we want to take care of them. We want to know that we're not going to leave them, you know, out on the battlefield, so to speak. When they get ill, they get sick, and they need our help, that we're going to move them whatever it takes from airplanes, helicopters, to trucks, to vehicles, to a health facility where they can get the medical support that they need. And we've been moving quite a number 
of people. And Amr will be able to actually, actually get into the weeds on that and how we've done it and working with WHO, working with the other agencies to do just what we're talking about. And so, but this, let me say this, because we still got a long ways to go. I mean, COVID is running its course right now. It's nowhere near over in the economic deterioration that's continuing to ripple throughout Africa, especially in the Middle East, is nowhere near done. Uh, that's why we're so worried, because we take a short and a long-term analysis to see, oh my gosh, because you just don't move enough, feed, enough food to feed 100 million people overnight. You got to think through these things and now talk about 270 million people at risk. It's a game changer. And if we don't come in there right, you're going to have famine. You're going to have destabilization and you're going to have mass migration that will destabilize countries around the world. And so, but we've got solutions. You know, we have a vaccine against starvation. We have a vaccine against famine. It's called food. And all we need is the money and the access to get it done. And so that's what we do best. But we need the private sector engaging with us now financially and more importantly, long term is being partners on the ground to end hunger. Uh, this more like I was saying earlier in a more sustainable way because the private sector has created the system in place where we're no longer needing to be there. Well, I think it was uh, in the announcement by the Nobel Committee underlining why this was recognition as a peace prize. World Food Program's significant contribution to stopping the weaponization of food. The, the World Food Program's creating conditions for peace. The World Food Program by addressing underlying conditions, as you said it, hunger begets war, war begets hunger. And about 100 years ago, Minnesota farmers and our milling companies responded, Europe was starving. And eventually 45 countries got fed and got relief during that First World War period. And I know that that impacted General Eisenhower because I've read a lot of his writings and I've heard his speeches about the, the desperation of children after the wars. And so those younger leaders in that First World War period were the senior leaders who saw a Second World War and said, we cannot go on their energy to create this system that you now are leading and all of those amazing people are making happen. We've inherited a legacy, but Eisenhower's most profound words about this was all of those who sacrificed their lives in, the, in that Second World War and that D-Day and all of that bought us time to see if we can in fact make sure there isn't another world war. So we've bought time. COVID and pandemic has reminded us we're not in control of everything, but you today have given us a vision that we know what to do. We know how to solve this. We know how to handle this, but we need to have the resources to do it. And you pointed out that the world has a lot of resources, even in this disrupted period. Your leadership, and the leadership of Amr and all those people making this happen for us today is the kind of inspiration that can help us on those tough days when you know we have to face some kind of dilemma. You described the one at night that you face. So you're in the middle of traveling in all these countries. You've given us a few stories of people who with pride talked about you know, creating a new system so that it didn't flood immediately or the woman who has a chance. Do you get enough of those stories, that pride, that accomplishment that gives you the vitamins you need to keep going? Or how do you keep your heart alive and open in the midst of doubling now the work you have to do and it's people's lives that's in your hands? You know, I, I know probably many of you've heard the story about the about the father and the little little girl about five, six years old after a, a, a big summer storm at the beach and their early morning walking on the, on the sand, the seashore. And they're literally like hundreds of thousands of starfish 
you know, up on the seashore, go be dying. And the little girl picks up one, throws in the water, picks up another, throws in the water, picks up another, throws in the water. The dad's like, you know, Susie, that you can't, there are hundreds of thousands of them. You can't make a difference. And she picks up one more, looks at it, shows her dad and said, dad, it makes a difference to that one. And so I know our teams, we see every human being, when we talk about 270 million people on the brink of starvation, we put faces to that. When you talk about 690 million people chronically hungry, we put a face with that. That could be your little girl. That, and in fact, it is your brother and sister in humanity around the world. You know, I'm a person of faith and I believe that every human being is created equally. And when one suffers, we all suffer. And so I like to be inspired to help every single child. I like to try to think that's my little girl. What would I do if that was my little girl or my little boy? And then when you see those little girls and those little boys out there in the midst of the most devastating circumstances and you see that, that those bright eyes and the spirit of humanity, it just empowers you and inspires you uh, to move forward. And it also encourages you to stand strong and be tough against those who are not letting us have the access, who are using food as a weapon of war. And, uh, you know, people who go into meetings with me, they sometimes like, oh, no, he's fixing to take somebody's head off. And sometimes I do. Uh, but usually I usually try to encourage people positively. I, that's, that's the way I am. Muffy can tell you that. I'm always positive. But, but if I see somebody doing something that really is wrong and denying people the support they need and, and people dying, then you'll see the flip side. And that's what we've got to have. We've got to have moral strength and leadership today in the world. We've got to stand for what is good and what is right. We're neutral. We're independent. But we're not neutral and, and independent when it comes to basic fundamental humanitarian values. I think this morning, your kickoff for our World Food Day has been both inspiring, but also giving people hope that each of us can make whatever contribution is within our realm of life, within our realm of who we are and what we can do. But it's also a reminder that we have to stay strong. We have to stay committed it is hard some days, especially with COVID and the fact that we can't support each other the same way we might because we're all kind of separated out. But if we can keep remembering those moments, you know, 100 years ago when, you know, the Midwest US kind of fed all of Europe because Europe was starving because of war. If we can remember the stories that you've told and also the values that drive us, um, it then gives us the momentum we need to keep moving forward. I just love the fact that you had given us a sense of, you know, we had made some real progress and we were on a path. Zero hunger is a concept by 2030. Some people get hungry because you don't know about floods and you don't know about tornadoes. And so you got to respond and you've built that system. But what you've done is you've given us the momentum to say it's not going to be a simple straight path. That's not how it works. We're humans. We have weather, we have nature, but we also have our faith and our values to keep us going. We also now have some of the stories that you've shared with us to keep us going. We have the Nobel, Norwegian Nobel Committee saying, you know, we need to lift up again the notion of the link between food and, and basic, basic rights, basic necessities, basic needs, and peace and war. So I want to thank you so much for taking time to be part of this World Food Day. A uh, year from now, we'll be able to look back and see how did we do in 2021. I want to invite you back then to see how did we do. But I also want to give you the last word to be able to say, um, you know, your last words for uh, inspiring our audience. And then we're going to show everybody that incredible video that, that takes that story of the common services and brings it alive for everyone to see as we, we take it out. Well, Mark, thank you. Uh, I'm honored to be here. And I do hope a year from now we look back and we were able to do what we've done so far this year, avert famine. And it's going to take a lot of effort. It's going to take a lot of money. It's going to take all of us coming uh, together. 
and uh, and I pray and hope that 2021 is not anything like 2020. And uh, to say it could get worse, let me tell you, it, it can get a lot worse. But if we stand together, and I mean that, uh, I, I think it's the heart of the American people. I can't remember it, whether it was Alexis or Tocqueville. I've heard it was, and I've heard it, well, it's not sure. You know, that comment that America's great because America is good. If America ever ceases to be good, America ceases to be great. Well, I believe in the American people. And uh, I believe people of all different religions and backgrounds and cultures and different colors of skin and everything, we come together, uh, the common good for the people around the world. Yes, we go take care of the American people. We need to do that. But at the same time, the people around the world are dependent on us. And I believe uh, in you. I believe in, uh, Mark, what you guys are doing at Global Minnesota. It makes a difference. Uh, just like the little starfish with the little girl. I know some people, well, I can't give it $5. I can't, well, you know, it makes all the, the widow's might. It makes all the difference in the world. Do what you can do. And uh, whether you give, uh, go online, WFP USA, or uh, sharethemill.org, or, or just locally, working with your senators and your congressmen, your political leaders, or just go into another neighborhood. You'll be surprised what you can do and what you'll see, open up your heart, and, uh, and you'll be quite amazed. And I think you'll find that you'll be the beneficiary when it's all said and done. So thank you, Mark. Thank you so much, David. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye, Muffy. See you later. Bye-bye. Thank you.